Uh, we will get started here. I think everybody has got their coffee and everyone is cooking. So we are ready to go. All right. So let me introduce um, uh, Dr. Christopher Dini. Um, he is our current director of the Legal Laboratory for Energetics, also known as LLT, uh, locally here. Before coming here, he was the chief science and technology officer at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, PNNL. And before that, it spent some time at Sandia National Airport. So we are very uh, grateful that he agreed to come and give a talk to us about the status of the research going on at the NLE. And I'm sure you will be, uh, you need to know that. Ah, okay, then that's that. We can then this campus. So with that, please. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, first things first, who's all seen the movie Train Spotting? <laughs> so think of this next hour is going to be like train spotting, but with physics and technology wrapped in. And so if I you don't follow my accent because I you know, start to speak quickly, you know, just pause me and I'll I, and I'll, I'll try to slow down. Second, a couple a lot of my colleagues are here from the laboratory for laser energetics. So if you ask me a hard question, I will almost immediately punt it to them uh, rather than me try to answer. And finally, I'm old, but I actually still remember what it was like to be a student. So you guys have got your cookies, you've got your coffee, you've signed in. So I will close my eyes for 10 seconds. And if you want to seek out before I start, go for it, Max. So, no, it's my pleasure today to come and talk about LLE. It, it is a, you know, of the many gems this university has, it is, it is definitely uh, a, one of them. And uh, it's amazing how many people I talk to in this town that actually do not know LLE exists and, and what, you know, what it does. So hopefully you already do, and uh, hopefully I'll give you a little bit more information on it. Uh, I jokingly call this making light of the future because in many ways that's exactly where we're headed. You know, we are working on the next generations of laser technology that will advance science in many areas. Uh, but uh, as you can tell, there's lots of a sense of humor. So I'll also try to make light of it as I, I go along as well. And hopefully this will advance, there we go. So I'll talk briefly about LLE, talk a little bit about our vision or strategy, uh, give you some examples of what motivates the science and technology that we work on, and then do some deep dives into how we're progressing in some of our core missions, and then basically how we use lasers to do that and how we need to pioneer the next generation of lasers to advance the science and prepare for the future. So our vision is to be the leading academic institution in fusion, high density science and laser technology at scale. The two images that are shown there are the Omega-60 laser and Omega-EP that presently reside at LLE. They are the biggest lasers anywhere in academia, anywhere in the world. Right? One of them would be that true, and we've got both. Uh, so again, a gem of the, the university that a lot of people don't know about. And in fact, until the National Ignition Facility was built at Livermore, California, these were the biggest lasers in the world, and many experiments were conducted on them. And that allows us to say at scale, when students do their PhDs with us, they are working on lasers that, and working with engineers, scientists, technicians, computational scientists, that that immersion is such that when they leave, they can walk into any large institution, a national lab, NASA, L3 Harris, you name it, and they walk in sort of knowing how to fit in and do big things because they've worked on these lasers. So that's what drives us in our education mission. You know, we educate, we do, a, you know, hopefully high quality science, we train our students well, but they're getting trained at scale in that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary world that many uh, companies, academic institutions, and national labs desire. You can't without leadership in science and technology. And this is a picture of Dustin Roller getting his EO Lawrence Award. We could have a picture of Donna Strickland, who got a, did her PhD in 1985 and also got a Nobel Prize in 2018 based on the work that she did in 1985. So to educate and to drive the mission, we have to be leaders in science and the quality of the science we do is critically important. Lastly, innovation. Innovation in that scale 
are dynamic tension sometimes. You know, when things are big and they cost a lot, it tends to be a little bit risk averse. You know, don't do anything to, you know, to make sure you get the data. But we are in that sweet spot where it's big enough to be relevant and to train people well, but still small enough, 10 shots a day on each of those facilities, sometimes 12, sometimes eight, depending on the complexity, that you can actually take risks. You can actually try something new and if it pans out, great. If it doesn't, you know, fine, you know, we'll learn and come back to it. So it's a really interesting sweet spot for us. And it's one of the things that makes it unique. So I believe right now, you know, February 13th, you know, 2023, we actually meet our vision, our goal. You know, my goal as a director is to make sure we continue to do that. Uh, not to remember every day, you know, scientists are not the best. Today's February the 13th, so tomorrow is February the 14th. So if you haven't got your cards or, got, you know, whatever, you know, you can leave early. We'll be excused. So that's our vision. How do we get there in the future? We have six key strategies. One, is, and the boldest is, you know, we, we, we will not post the biggest laser in the world probably anymore. I'll come back to that. We may post the most powerful one, but we will not post the biggest, most energetic laser in the world in the future. But we want to be an active part in designing the next one. And, and so, you know, we've got a bold strategy looking forward to 2040 about how we work with the Department of Energy to be an active part in building a robust high yield fusion facility, something that's even bigger than the National Ignition Facility at Livermore just now. In the path to there, big, big lasers don't shoot often. Back to what we talked about, about agility at scale, big driving innovation. We're looking at a next generation version of Omega, and I'll write at the end that might, we hopefully will be bigger. I'll talk a little bit about some of the attributes of, of the laser source that it would have. But one of the things that's driving is we like to really fire 10,000 shots a year on that thing. Not, you know, we already do well a thousand shots a year in both of our facilities. We'd like to design that so that it shoots every five minutes, roughly speaking. So that, you know, that changes the paradigm of how we operate. You know, humans are no longer in the loop, they're on the loop. You know, you need machine learning, AI control systems. You need targets coming in every few minutes being automatically aligned. And so we're really excited about that. And we're now trying to persuade the sponsor that, you know, they might want to open their wallet and pay for it sometime in the future. We're not rushing to it, but we've told them, we'll take the next few years explaining what we want to do. Uh, key to everything is the next generation workforce. Uh, we want to make sure we look like America and that, you know, in plasma physics, it's, you know, has lagged a lot of the other scientific disciplines and sort of becoming, you know, and looking more like America. So we're actively trying to correct that. And some of that also is technical as well, as mentioned in machine learning and AI. Again, if our graduate students are working in a place where they've been exposed to, here's how you bring machine learning or AI solutions into your uh, science, that will prepare them for future uh, exciting positions. A national innovation hub, and I'll expand out in this image. This is one that uh, John Zugel gave me. You know, we have invented nearly all the technologies or innovated all the technologies that uh, big lasers use around the world. And we'll unpack that a little bit. So again, we want to be a national innovation hub, and we have John and uh, Tom Brown have actually submitted a proposal to the National Science Foundation, National Science Foundation on a regional innovation engine centered in Rochester building on the legacy of optics that live, you know, that's here because of the Institute of Optics, because of Kodak, East Kodak Eastman, uh, Xerox, but now we're looking to the future, what does that look like in the 21st century versus, you know, the early 19th century? And basically, I just touched on that one. So Jonathan Gruber, an economist, wrote a book about how the U.S. has to change the way it invests in science and technology to sort of regain its preeminence as a, as a leading economic nation. And actually, the tip in that book, there's a table of what's the cities that that could happen at. And number one in the list is Rochester, because of you all, University of Rochester, because of RIT, because of MCC, because of that sort of you know large industrial base that we we had. So, uh, so we want to be an active part of that. And you know, as Tom Brown and John Dougal are sort of leading that effort for the university. And the last one is just one for us is just modernizing management systems. So that's important for all of these. And so we're, we're busy doing those. And I'll try to relate back to some of these strategies as I'm talking. So that innovation sort of journey, uh, you know, starts back in 1978. So a quick brief history of uh, LLE. So Moshe Lubin was a professor at the Institute of Optics. 
you know, 1960 lasers were invented, the ruby laser. Uh, Moshe realized this is something that the Universe at Rochester with the long history of the Institute of Optics should be actively engaged in. By 1970, he persuaded the university to establish LLE. By 1976, we had our, the building that we're in presently, the start of that building, and we were working on a path for the first sort of biggish lasers and developing those lasers. Um, that included like 1978, developing uh, neodymium phosphate glass. 1980s, figuring out how you move from one omega in neodymium glass, which is usually about you know micron, one point uh, five four microns, to short wavelengths, because it turns out uh, plasmas don't like infrared. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll unpack laser plasma instabilities, but you know, you've all heard of the ultraviolet catastrophe when you're learning about the black body radiation. Well, it turned out in laser plasma interactions, it was an infrared catastrophe. Infrared was horrible. Um, in fact, Lionel really learned it because they were doing CO2 lasers at 10 microns. And so LLE took an idea and perfected it to be able to use crystals, nonlinear uh, optics effects in crystals, to basically go from one omega to three omega to blue, uh, which again, you know, every big laser that now uses that either to go to green or uh, blue uh, by frequency tripling. So all along, we continue to sort of innovate designs. Obviously, 1985, the big one, uh, we invented short pulse amplification. How do you make, you know, what's already a short pulse? You know, nanoseconds, how do you compress that down to even shorter duration and uh, push the power up? That was invented by uh, Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland, uh, and they got the Nobel Prize in 2018 for that invention. And actually, last year, they got the Golden Goose Award because Bladeless LASIK derived exactly from that technology. Actually, it was a laser accident, you know, and the doctors uh, treating the student they got exposed realized, you know, wow, this might be a good way to treat eyes. So, so all along, we continue to do that. And so, uh, and I'll, we'll talk a lot bit now about some of our capabilities in the optical parametric amplification and the paths it's opening up for the future of lasers. And uh, I'll also talk about the Semika laser, which uh, John Zugel and his team have been developing. Uh, so we're actually under contract from Stanford to deliver them a laser. So that you know that's how good we are with laser technology. Other national labs, other larger academic institutions came to us for both the dynamic compression laser, which sits at Argonne, like the Argonne uh, photon source in Chicago. And now we're building another laser to go to uh, Stanford to combine with the X-ray three electron laser at LCLS. So long history of innovation. We want to continue that. Uh, I'll briefly touch on something that was in the news. So how many of you heard about the ignition result? Yep. So um, all credit to the Livermore team at the National Ignition Facility over the last few years, they've really dialed it in and you know got to the first result of 1.3 megajoules in August of 2021. NIF is a huge laser. Um, you know, as we're proud of our lasers, they're big. This is really big. That's three football fields. And I was a federal official who signed off in the critical decision four that said it was complete. And it was $3.504 billion to build. Uh, actually, that's not quite true because it was probably another one and a half billion dollars spent afterwards. But uh, so it's, you think about $5 billion to build that facility. World class, there is no laser bigger than it. And now, they do fusion. I'll unpack how you do it in a thing called a hall run. So it's a little cavity, and that's what holds a capsule. Um, a bit, NIF produces about 2 million joules of laser light, give or take. And they deliver it into that little hall run to drive fusion. For years, it was sitting, best result was a couple hundred kilojoules out. So 10% of what they were delivering in on the laser. Last August, in 20, or August 2021, they got to 1.3 megajoules. That proved some of the physics of fusion uh, using these certain laser drivers. And the paper that came out on that a PRL has something like 900 authors. 60 of those authors were LLE scientists and uh, engineers. So we were an active part of the, the path to ignition. And again, right at the tail end, for example, you go from infrared to blue uh, before you deliver energy. That was you know, an invention of LLEs. Some of the diagnostics were built by LLE. Uh, so basically, we made, our, made major sort of technical contributions. Well, then in December, they actually got a shot that produced more than two megajoules. It produced about 3.15 megajoules. 
So they actually have gain. They produce more energy out of the fusion process than delivered by all the users. Uh, and that was a big deal. And that's driven a lot of uh, excitement about the whole of the program. And I'll talk about how we are sort of going to use that for some of the, the future investments we want to make in so direct drive fusion as well. And I'll un unpack the differences. Remember I said education is important. Uh, you know, we are an academic institution. And so even though we're doing all the big science, contributing to big national milestones, education is at the heart of what we do. And there's, you know, we basically do what we call 360 degree training. Uh, uh, Mike Campbell, the previous director, called the four pie. But it's, we, don't, we don't want our students just learning the science and technology. We want our students learning how to communicate, how to communicate quickly on the results that they're doing, how to communicate to high-level officials who may not understand the science and you know, how do you uh, portray that. So that's Connor Williams, one of our PhD students. That's Joe Morelli, the congressman for New York 25, and Sarah Mangos, the president of the university. So we had Connor stand up and explain fusion to our congressman. He did a great job. When uh, Director and Chanathan from the National Science Foundation was here, we rolled out our students to sort of give them talk, to get the flash talks and the research. Key part of science is being able to communicate it. Um, we're producing about 10 PhDs a year. We typically have something like uh, 60 PhDs with the Horton Fellows rolling through uh, LLE at any given time. And then we have a lot of collaborators from other academic institutions. So we typically have about 100 graduate students in, in flight through different academic institutions and ourselves. Uh, and so this is actually a picture that Eugene took of uh, one of our uh, uh, laser user group meetings. And that's some of the students coming from all the other academic institutions that come to use LA, Michigan, uh, UCSD, MIT, UCLA. So we have students come in and do their research on our facilities. And I'll, I'll touch back on that. And then inspiring the next generation back. Remember the strategy workforce, you know, we have to look like America for the next generation. Uh, so we've done a great job with high school programs, uh, reaching out now. We, start, we started after COVID or reach out into the inner city schools. Uh, to basically connect to some of the students there and give them a research, you know, summer opportunity as a high school student. We actually had a uh, a middle school student last summer who, or this summer, uh, last summer, yeah, who wants to be an uh, astrophysicist. And so we actually figured out how could we get a middle schooler in, you know, to involved in our, our, our summer program. And so that worked really well. Uh, and we're trying to grow that. So basically reach out, so not just educate, but give people a chance to see, well, there's a really good careers and exciting science going on there. If our, if our regular high school program that's been, been operating for a while, we've had 100 high school, 400 high school students go through LLE. More than 100 of them now have actually ended up doing PhDs or MDs. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a really good immersive engagement and really inspires them to sort of go in a, a STEM career. And just to prove my point, so Ignition, this is the press release that was held at DOE on ignition. And that, this is the panel that answered questions. So Secretary of Energy, Grant Holm talk, uh, Kim Bedell, the lab director, Livermore talk, uh, the head of the Office of Science talk. And then they brought up the Livermore team for a panel discussion. So Mark and Denver did experiments on Omega. The two PIs for the shots, both did their PhDs, different academic institutions, but both actually working at the Omega laser. Uh, our pack basically work here and Tammy did shorts. So between all the people on the panel, more, you know, they basically had almost one year's worth of shots on our Omega facilities between them all. And so that's part of that education is not only when they're doing the PhDs, some of them came back as early career scientists in the labs, getting shots to do basic science or, you know, do their research on Omega. So it really shows sort of the impact of the, the facility. So. That was just a high level intro. So now we do a bit of a deep dive into motivation. <clears throat> so we, we're, we're driven by three main things that sort of drive the science on the, the experiments we do in the large facilities. So one is laboratory astrophysics. Uh, and there was a great article by Adam Frank in Atlantic just last month. Uh, we didn't get mentioned. He kept. He told us he kept on putting our name in, but the editor took it out. And I understand that the editors like to sort of wait for, wait for crisp messages. 
But Adam's article is all about how these big facilities have changed the way people do astrophysics. It's no longer just an observational science coupled with some simulations. We actually have the ability to do lab experiments that are informative about the uh, astrophysics as well. Materials extreme conditions. Uh, uh, some of you may have taken courses from uh, Rip Collins. Basically, these facilities allow you to compress materials to pressures equivalent to the center of the Earth, equivalent to the center of Jupiter, uh, Saturn, uh, stars. So, and you can go in and measure the properties. Again, unique capability to sort of provide data to uh, uh, the rest of the scientific community. And the grand challenge, fusion. How do you make fusion work in the laboratory? And why is fusion important? The base of the powers of the Earth. Uh, I would ask you to think hard about what energy source we use that ultimately did not derive from solar energy. Right? I mean, so fossil fuels. Guess what kept those you know dinosaurs warm before they died and get turned into oil? You know, the sun. The vegetation that were eaten were powered by the sun. Wind power driven by the thermal radiance driven by the sun. Uranium that we burn in nuclear reactors, nuclear nucleosynthesis. So that was a sun blowing up, and you know through that you know and basically driving materials back up higher than iron, you know, in the periodic table. So so solar and fusion is an important energy source to understand. So that's why Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, fun work. And fusion is at the heart of the U.S. and other nuclear weapons. So basically, NNSA is very interested in making sure we can do fusion in the laboratory. And finally, big interest now in fusion again, especially after that ignition result, is potentially a, a, a cleaner, low carbon, lower nuclear waste option for you know base load production that can be sited close to communities. Communities do not want nuclear reactors anymore, uh, and so uh, which is unfortunate because they're actually incredibly safe, but people don't like them, and so. You know, they're, uh, they're, you know, fusion would be a great alternate alternative. And, you know, unfortunately, all the other renewable energy sources don't work well everywhere. So Ernie Manise, who was the Secretary of Energy, used to say, uh, when it comes to what's the energy solution for, the, you know, the nation, the world, it says it's like a multiple choice. The answer is E, all of the above, solar, wind, hydro. Nuclear, you know, fusion being a cleaner version and a safer version of nuclear, all needs to be in the mix. And so uh, this is a picture of a, a prototype reactor that's uh, been designed actually by a common Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which is a startup in Boston spinning out of MIT. So big interest now in can you actually drive to an energy source uh, based on fusion. And Secretary Granholm at the ignition result basically said she has a decadal vision. She wants fusion on the grid um, in a decade. Which is going to be true. Fusion is always on the grid. It's just a small matter of which direction the electricity is flowing. But it's uh, but it is always on the grid. So how do we do fusion? Uh, we do inertial confinement fusion. There's three ways to do fusion. The sun gravitationally confines the fuel, compresses it, gets it hot enough that it ignites, and then the fusion process takes on. Uh, the plasma cell heats, you know, radi eventually radiation comes out. And we see the, the, so the, the sun from the, the radiation coming from the sun or other stars, but it's basically gravitational confined. The other way is magnetic. So you basically take a plasma, heat it up to the right temperature, keep it at some low H density, but then use big magnetic fields to keep it where you want and hold it for a long time, you know, tens of seconds, minutes. The last way is inertial confinement fusion. That's where I will take some deuterium tritium and compress it really quickly, get it to 30 million degrees centigrade or more, 10 times the density of copper, and I'll get fusion going. But I'll do it so fast that it doesn't have time to disassemble until the fusion process is done. And so that's called inertial confinement fusion. And how we do that is we take a capsule, Here's a, a pie slice. So there's deuterium tritium ice, which means you've made solid deuterium tritium about 20 degrees Kelvin and turned it into a nice uh, hollow shell. You're doing that inside a plastic ablator and you'll get some DT gas. You then, and that's an example of one of the pellets we shoot. It's about a millimeter in size. 
You then take the laser light, directly radiate that, that plastic. It blows up, and just like the rocket motion, the plastic comes shooting out at high velocity. There's a force directed inwards that pushes the rest of the plastic and the deuterium ice towards the center of that capsule. Um, you get fairly high velocities. You can maybe push 300 kilometers per second. So it's, it's, it's moving pretty fast. Uh, you have sent some shocks in, and if you do it right, there's enough of the fuel still moving in just as all those shocks cause the center of the deuterium tritium to get hot enough to fuse. You know, fusion is you take a deuteron and a triton, bind them together. And if you do it at high enough energy, like 30 million degrees, 50 million degrees centigrade, they have enough velocity they can penetrate through their Coulomb barriers and the nuclear force gets kicks in and will stick and they'll basically create a helium uh, atom and the mass difference you know, equals mc squared turns into energy. So you got a neutron coming out at 14 and a half MeV and an alpha particle at about four and a half MeV. That alpha particle lovely heats the fuel and so it bootstraps. So it self-heats and suddenly the energy deposition from those alphas exceeds everything you put in. And so that's how you get a, a fusion burn wave that gets more energy out than you put in. So that's the principle. Uh, that's an example of what the layer the capsule looks like with a layer and the hot spot, as I said, you know, tens of millions of degrees, many times solid density. Unfortunately, it would be lovely if it was as easy as that cartoon, but it's not. Right? So, so, and the complexity starts from the beginning. You start shining laser light on the capsule. Well, the, you know the late, you know the lasers aren't actually completely spherical, so they're coming in a number of points. So you have to figure out how many points, how big. They try to get it as uniform as possible to make the collapse uniform. The laser mainly gets absorbed, but doesn't completely all get absorbed. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how you maximize that absorption. Uh, the ablation. You've got to make sure you come out and ablate fast. You keep it dense, so you're having to figure out how you optimize that. Uh, you have to figure out the equation of state of the materials to figure out the shock timing. And you have to make sure the lasers are very uniform because if they have any speckle and small wavelength stuff, that actually creates instabilities caused by the very rapid acceleration. And when I say rapid acceleration, the, the, the G numbers here are in excess of 10 to the 10 G. Right, so massive accelerations. So any perturbations will grow like in the form of really Taylor instabilities. Uh, as the plasmas are blowing up from the ablation, right, the plasmas start interacting with the lasers, and you know plasmas are smarter than us. So once you get a plasma above 10 eV to quote uh, Edward Teller, it's smarter than most people. So it starts doing all sorts of weird things with the laser energy. And so we, and we have to figure out how to fix that. Uh, and so it goes on and on for all the physics. So, so basically, that's why LLE is so big. So we have so many diagnostics, so many people, because we're trying to understand all of that. But that said, we've actually made fantastic progress. So this is our neutron outputs from our ICS shots since 2015. So we basically went up by about a factor of six in the last sort of seven years. Uh, driven by our improved understanding. One of those things is we brought in statistical modeling. So not quite full machine learning or AI, but we have enough data because we shoot so often and we've been able to do a lot of calculations to basically use that to guide us on the difference between our optimistic calculations and what reality is going to be. So that's really allowed us to perfect calculations and predict what might happen if we shoot it. Uh, also, there's a thing called the generalized loss and criteria. That basically tells you, have I made the plasma hot enough, dense enough, and I've held it together long enough to get fusion. And what we've seen is one would be Nirvana, that would be ignition. We scale our results and we're basically in the region of that general loss and criteria of the point eight. So we believe we have a path for direct drive to a fusion system. That was not the case in 92 when the government decided to build MIF. At that point, we were too far away for direct drive to be really a credible primary option for the National Ignition Facility. We believe that that's changing in that next generation facility. Direct drives at, at least should be an equal player. Another good thing about what we did in the statistical modeling 
one of the big problems with machine learning is people just take lots of data, throw it at a deep neural network, it learns something, but you never really understand why. The scientists that did the, the statistical analysis here built a statistical model that was actually predicated on sort of the physics domain knowledge, what would be the key parameters, and then they did the fit through that. And then so that not only did that help guide it, but it also told us why we were making the changes. And so that's been you know critically important to drive how quickly we've improved. But what's the what's the forefront problem next? So uh, there's a thing called cross beam energy transfer. Uh, again, back to plasma has been devious little uh, uh, entities. When you set, send a laser light in and you create a plasma, that's fine. If there's laser light coming in from another direction, guess what? Chances are the plasma waves that you have created are perfectly base matched and angular matched to take energy from one beam and send it up the other beam, uh, which is a real problem. So I'm, I'm putting all this energy in from my laser beam at this angle, and the plasma is saying, no, you're not, and it's taking some fraction of my energy. That can be tens of percent and sending it back out that way. Obviously, that limits your ability to couple into a capsule and drive ICS. So if you look at where we are just now, this blue curve omega with, with, with CBET, because we can't solve it right now, we're driving ablation pressures of 100 million atmospheres. So when that laser impinges in that plastic ablator, we're pushing pressures of 100 million atmospheres. Uh, just for comparison, the center of Jupiter is about 70 million atmospheres. So that's how high the pressure is on that ablator. But we need it to be higher. If you look at the uh, what NIF would be doing, uh, about two megajoules of laser light, NIF is actually about two... 100 megabar, because they're using that little canister, that hall run, to convert from laser light to x-rays, which gives them a higher drive pressure. So we're about half of that. Well, the problem is, if you say, oh, okay, Chris, I'll give you miraculously a two megajoule direct drive laser, how will that do? That's a red curve, because although I've got more energy, my capsule's bigger, I generate more plasma. And so what I find is, with CBET, my pressure goes down in my ablator, a little bit, even though I've got 10 times, no, actually, you know, more than 10 times the energy. So if you get rid of the CBET, the dotted blue line, which is omega at present, goes up to really nice pressures. You know, we can actually push about 200 megabar and omega if we could just solve CBET right now. Unfortunately, to solve it, we have to change the laser architecture. But more importantly, if we can get rid of that, the red curve shows you what would happen if you gave me that miraculous two megajoule laser, but now I've solved, get rid of CBET. Now I'm up at you know, pressures that would match what NIF could do in direct drive. So for us, figuring out a laser technology that allows us to solve the cross beam energy transfer is the cutting edge that we, of work that we have to do. And just this is just sort of eye candy just to show that, you know, I'll, I'll briefly talk through it, but as the laser light goes into that plasma, it's, at first it can be scattered back because of plasma waves. The seabed can happen at a little bit higher density. And then right at the end, as the photons are getting absorbed, they can decide again because of, you know, sort of interesting phase matching. Oh, we'll take all that photon energy and split it into two plasma waves, two plasmons, and those then surf the electrons in the plasma up to high energy and preheat your capsule, which stops ignition as well. So there's just a myriad of things that can go wrong as the lasers interact with the, the plasma. And we're actually really good at it. So that's how we are figuring out how to solve it. So for all of you who ever, for somebody says, well, what's science about? Science is about giving you the toolkit to, go, to make what you want to make or to solve problems when they appear. Because... When the problem hits, you'll really be happy if you've done the science thoroughly beforehand because you'll solve the problem. So one of the ways we do that is um, Thompson scattering. It's a way to diagnose plasmas. So we've been looking in detail about how lasers interact with plasmas. And so I won't go through all of this, but we've published a multitude of papers where using, you know, and I'll show you this advanced Thompson diagnostic, which is miraculous. But through that diagnostic, we're actually going in and telling people what's the distribution of electrons and ions in the plasma. Again, a, a, a measurement that five years ago, people probably would never have believed you could make. And, and this is how it works. You, because one of the things you want to do is 
measure the scattered spectrum from all angles. Historically, up to this diagnostic, people would put laser, uh, a diagnostic probe in and look at the scattered light at one angle. At that one angle, you learn something very interesting about the plasma, and you can tell something about ions or electrons, but that angle usually determines which factor is going to be more important. If I can collect the scattered light from 120 degrees, I can go from the regions where the electron waves are important to the regions the ion waves are important, all in a single shot, and actually understand what's happening. And so uh, Joe Katz and Bob Boney took some interesting ideas from the scientists and actually figured out the optical methods to actually do that. Uh, and that involves, you know, catching it with a, you know, a mirror, bouncing it off another mirror, almost like a Schwarzschild microscope, running it through some optics and then basically collecting it on a detector. And when I say, you know, optics, these are precision optics. Uh, you know, that's the collecting mirror, that's the, the, the bouncing mirror. That is a achromatic lens that's like, we call it the toothpick lens. It's a few millimeters, four millimeters wide and 17 millimeters tall. And that's required to sort of read, you know, sort of image the, the collected laser light. So fantastic piece of optical design. It's actually driven uh, an advanced diagnostic. And because of that understanding, what we've learned is we're going to give the very hard problem to John Zugel and Jake Bromage, right? Because Actually, yeah, John instantly passed it to Jake. Right? So it turns out we all learn lasers are monochromatic. That's one of the beautiful things about lasers, more divergence, monochromatic, ultra intensity. Well, it turns out we don't want it to be monochromatic. We want it to have some spectral width. And so, and what we find is if we do simulations on laser absorption, right now we're about 60% absorbed into the capsule with all those effects. If we could get to 1% or more, bandwidth, we actually absorb 90%. So there's another 30% of energy we could actually deliver into the target. Uh, that two plasma on decay, where the photon splits into two plasma waves that surf the electrons up to high uh, velocity. If we can get up to you know, four or 5% bandwidth, the threshold for that instability kicking in goes way up. So we can increase the intensity safely to drive at higher pressure the, the capsule without preheating. Another one is if it's spectrally broad, actually makes smoothing the beam easier as well. So any in, uh, any deviation gets smooth, you know, within a few picoseconds. So we are normally driving for a billionth of a second, ten billionths of a second. So that gives us time to sort of smooth it out. So the secret is bandwidth, bandwidth, bandwidth. And so that's where we're going to be going with our laser technology. Just as a function of time, I'll just touch on high pressure materials. <clears throat> before I go into what we're doing capability in laser space. Um, like I mentioned, we, we can drive pressures equivalent to the center of giant planets, fusion conditions. So this is a plot that from, I stole from Rick Collins. Of, if you look at temperature and degrees Kelvin and density in grams per cc, uh, the National Academy of Science has found high energy density science is anything greater than one megabar. And so that could be one megabar not so hot, but really high density, or it could be really high temperature, not so dense, right? But it maps out of phase space. Well, there's another pressure range where you're now dealing with pressures that are equivalent to your know, sort of binding energy divided by the you know the Bohr radius cubes, you know, by your volume of your sort of atomic structures. That's you know what we call atomic pressures. And we can get to pressure ranges like that as well, terapascal. So we basically opened up a whole new front in our high density of physics with these large lasers. We're actually now able to do at LLE very high quality density functional theory simulations. So we actually can do quantum mechanical predictions of what the structures might be like at these high pressures. We can do all sorts of pre-compression and compre you know, in shock uh, type experiments. So we can map out huge phase spaces and we're now developing X-ray diffraction. So we can take these materials to pressures equivalent to the center of a giant planet, or more importantly, some of the exoplanets have been discovered now, because the, the exoplanets may be Earth-like, but they're super Earth-like. They're bigger than Earth, many times bigger than Earth. So what's the, what do their structures look like? We can go in with the fraction and determine what the, the, the actual physical structure of a material is, at the pressure, the size of a, a planet that's 100 Earth masses, and, make a, uh, and actually feed that back to the lab astrophysicists and say, 
that was a lovely paper you published, but it was wrong, right? And so that's how science works. So and these are just some examples of diffraction where you can take platinum and at 250 gigapascals, you can see you actually have a diffraction pattern that tells you that it's got a crystalline structure. And smart people, not me, can tell you what type of crystal structure that is. If you take it up to a higher pressure, what you actually find is it starts to melt. And so all these nice diffraction lines start becoming blurred because you've lost your structure, right? It's starting to go into the melt phase. So we can take materials up to you know, hundreds of GPA and actually start telling you, here's the structure and here's where the melt line is. Melt lines are very important for planetary science because just like our Earth dynamo is a solid core, you know, potentially rotating within a fluid, it's what gives you the magnetic field. You want to understand our giant planet, you know, exoplanets, all solid or it's liquid because that can drive a dynamo and they potentially could have a magnetic field as well. Which, generally speaking, if you're close to a sun, a magnetic field is a good thing. So, uh, so basically, the planetary scientists love this stuff. And I'll skip this. We're doing the same with gases as well. So, all cool science, the science has to drive the technology, then allows you to go back and do the science. So, you know, we work in diagnostics and detectors. We have to pay attention to how well we operate. We do a lot of advanced engineering. We do amazing simulations to get the job done. We make our own targets, 2,500 a year. We advance the laser technology required. So we have to, you know, LLE is vertically integrated. We have to do all of this to get the job done. And so I'll give you some examples of how we're advancing on those fronts. So our simulation capabilities, we're running 3D hydrodynamic simulations with Livermore. We have our own 2D and 1D codes. We're actually expert now at putting in how do you trace the interactions of those laser beams with the plasmas that you're creating. So we're actually taking our ray tracing capabilities and actually porting it over to other to national lab codes. So Los Alamos, for example, is working with us to put our capabilities into their very large codes. What we've learned from the statistical modeling and from this other work is we, we, we've not kept up with the pace of simulations. So right now we're working, Dell has been given an order from NNC to deliver two boxes to us that will go to our primary data center over on Science Road. Uh, to combine those two boxes, we'll have a, a, a power of about four petaflops. So uh, uh, the two boxes on the road will actually consume as much electricity as the rest of the primary data center as it presently is configured. But that will significantly, I mean, that's a quadrupling of our capability. It will let us do more calculations, which is useful for design, but also let us do more calculations so we can actually use machine learning to link the simulation results to the experimental results. So that, and that's a picture from uh, Oliver Twist. Oliver, uh, and he asked for more. And so our HBC guys came to us and said, can I have some more, please? And they said, yes. So, uh, the other thing in computational space is, you know, we brought, uh, the Flash Center from the University of Chicago, you met, some of you may have met Petros Savarakaras, who's the Flash director. Uh, this was a, you know, a marriage made in heaven. Flash was a designed to be a code for high-density experimentalists to use around the, the world. Uh, it's more than 3,000 users. You know, we have more than a few hundred, actually 400 registered users, usually 200 a year that come in and use our, exper uh, our experimental tools. So having flash centered here was great. And they actually got, uh, 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 we're highlighting science advances uh, last year for what they've done and looking at how plasmas inter interact. We would be simulating the early formation of the universe and why you basically see a discrepancy by how hot galaxy clusters are versus what previous simulation said. So flash has been used to you know, do calculations that design the laboratory experiments. First on Omega, and once we pioneered it, we took it to NIF. And so that was actually highlighted as a major sort of science advance as well. But other technical areas, uh, I'll skip some of them. We're developing some diagnostics to measure all these instabilities with Fresnel zone plates, but working in x-rays. So, you know, Fresnel zone plates are a pretty old technology. You know, lighthouses love them. But it turns out you can make use them in X-ray regimes, and we've developed Fresnel zone plates that allow us to get one micron resolution on the images of the well, on the plasmas that we're driving. 
even allowing you to pr actually image the shock running through the material uh, when it's actually shot by the laser. Uh, the university uh, was very gracious and basically has given us $42 million for a new building. So we're well on the way to constructing uh, another 60,000 square foot of lab and office space right, uh, on LLE campus. Um, it's actually way ahead of where it is in, in this image because the, this winter has been fantastic. Sorry, skiers. But it is been good for us to building a building where we, you know, we're six weeks ahead of schedule. I'll talk a little bit about some of our new lasers like Flux. Uh, but the targets are important. You know, we build these big lasers, we build all these diagnostics, and we whack things that are about a millimeter in size and for a billionth of a second, and we have to measure all, right? We have to measure what's happening for that billionth of a second and measure what's going on in detail. You have to know your initial conditions. So we've actually developed a coherent anti-soak remand spectroscopy that allows us to go in and actually measure the capsules and the targets, again, with micron scale resolution, so we know what we imploded when we flip the laser light onto them. And the next generation of targets actually uses foam. That's a... 3D printed foam ball that's a millimeter in size. It was printed with two photon polymerization, which allows you to completely control the size of the void, where the bars are, et cetera. Fantastic capability. And so I think we'll see a lot of revolution in our targets based on that. And this is a cryostat that we sent out to University of Nebraska Lincoln. They're experts in the coherent anti silk scattering. This is for a plastic shell. This is a cryostat that lets them freeze deuterium tritium. And so they're trying to show with that same technique that they can actually go measure what the deuterium tritium ice looks like as well. Now we'll skip that. So on to lasers. Um, John and his team have a, a, a great strategy that if you look at a natural confinement fusion, I just explained broadband, high bandwidth lasers are important. Also turns out if you follow the trajectory from the CPA work of uh, you know, Donna Strickland, Gerard Moreau, high bandwidth lasers, effectively CPAs in some ways you can think of it as doing like a Fourier transform. Sort of. And so uh, if you've got lots of spectral width, you Fourier transform that, you get very short pulses. And so we see that as a pathway to make very high intensity lasers uh, for the next generation of uh, ultra high intensity science. So broadband is key for everything we want to do next. The technology that allows you to do that is optical parameter uh, parametric amplification. I, I just simply call it magic crystals. Uh, so it's a very variation in, you know, in the nonlinear science that allows us to do frequency, you know, two omega, three omega frequency conversion. This allows you to do some very advanced, some frequency generation to, uh, to control the amplifier and take you away from the region of being worried about what's the actual gain curve of the glass. So great, great advance. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about, about the experts who are in the room. And this will open up the generation of lasers that allow us to do next generation ICF experiments and then these opal lasers for ultra high intensity uh, physics. So the building block is the, the pump laser and the John and his team have come up with a thing called the Amica design. Uh, this is actually the basis of the laser that we'll actually build for Stanford. It's a very highly packed, compact laser system. Uh, and there's been a number of innovations that allow you to do that. But that basically becomes the basis for lasers that we could send off to other people for their experiments or lasers to drive uh, our uh, optical parametric amplification systems. And we've actually built one already uh, called uh, MTW Opal. So we have a, uh, MTW was one of our smaller experimental lasers at LLE. Uh, so the team figured out you know, how to design a, a, a Opal front end for it. And the first light was last year, if I remember rightly, and we were actually got uh, 350 terawatt pulse, basically 20 femtosecond a second pulse. I don't know if we've got it a lot shorter than that yet. Uh, for doing these experiments, we're actually in the process next year of facilitating that to make it a, a user facility for our own research and for you know for others to collaborate with us. But great advance into our ultra pulse laser technology, and one of the reasons we did that was it was uh, a precursor to what we want to do next. So. First thing we need to do on the fusion application is show that this bandwidth gives us all the benefits we think we predicted. And so uh, John, uh, uh, pro, uh, other group leader, Liz Hill, has been leading a team to basically build this flux laser. So it will basically give us the bandwidth, about 1.5% bandwidth, about 150 joule laser pulse, only about 100 terawatts. 
But what we can do is we can bring that into the Omega chamber. Omega has about 60 laser beams. So we'll add the, the 61st. And then with a whole series of diagnostics, show that that high bandwidth beam can interact with the rest of the laser-driven plasmas. Uh, and we can quantify how much CBET we're getting from it, you know, you know, how much plasma instabilities we have, how is it interacting with the, you know, the, the plasma and actually show that the bandwidth does what we think it would. And that gives us the, the, the knowledge to go back to our sponsors and say, hey, now we need to figure out how we build a whole laser, you know, out of this technology. So this will come online next year. We'll have it, it's been, it's, the laser is actually working just now and we're building out through it. But next year, we'll actually be coupling the beam into the Omega chamber. And then, you know, we'll be doing the experiments to prove that the bandwidth has given us all the benefits. The other thing we've just done is a, there's a new proposal into the National Science Foundation. So I said, you know, we, we're unlikely to have the biggest laser in the world anymore. But what we want NNSF to do is to fund us to take that Opal technology, scale it up, you know, couple it with, you know, what we've learned with running the Petwatt laser that was based on uh, Gerard and Donna's uh, trip pulse amplification system and actually build a 25 Petwatt laser. So I think that would be the most powerful laser in the world. The, the Chinese uh, Shanghai Institute of Optics and Mechanics are talking about 100 Petwatt laser. I think our teams are a bit you know, skeptical that they'll get there. Uh, but we're pretty so rock solid in our belief that we could build a 25 Petwatt laser. So we hope to know this year... If NSF, if NSF will give us a planning grant, in which case we'll spend two years uh, refining the design, building the user community, and then hopefully persuade them to allow us to build the laser. And that'll be basically behind the other two lasers, the LLE. So that'll be, the between the laser and the building, that'll be more than a $100 million project to do that. So, so fingers crossed. And so hopefully I'll convince you, we have an exciting future. Uh, the near future, uh, the one thing I didn't mention is, you know, the lasers are getting old. Omega was you know, commissioned in 1996. Uh, EP was brought in line about 19, uh, 2007. So uh, we've actually, NNSC is looking at giving us about $50 million over the next five years, additional to our regular funding to actually sustain the lasers for the future, which is, is critical. So we have the uptime for, for users. Uh, but we also want to accelerate progress in direct drive fusion. Flux is the path to do that. Uh, we actually want to, with the existing facilities with MTW Opal uh, and EP, so show some of the some new physics that could be explored. Uh, the university has hired a new uh, uh, faculty leader, uh, Antonino Di Piazza, who will come into physics and astronomy, expert in sort of high field physics, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, and so he'll be sort of, sort of theoretically laying out some of the work that we could do with. EP Opal if it's funded. We're also expanding our education opportunities. Laura Cappy over there just joined us as our undergraduate coordinator. I mentioned our high school program and I mentioned our PhD students. We actually have quite a few undergrads. We should actually have more, uh, but we just have never really had a, a architecting program for it. You know, we, you know, people have reached out to supervise uh, the professors and assist and basically had the connection. We're trying to actually have a formal process so we can actually have more undergraduate participation uh, in the research activities that we do. And then we're also starting to identify with the community what that next generation facility would look like. Uh, we know we want to fire lots of shots because all the next generation facilities will be bigger, which means less shots. So if we want to stay innovative and move at a pace, we need somewhere where we can actually get even more shots than we presently do. Uh, we're looking at the energy range. Um, with advances in laser technology, we think we could push three or four times more than, you know, Omega. We actually would like to go a lot more. We'd actually like to make this an ignition facility and actually be able to make capsules ignite, which we believe we could probably do at somewhere above 300 kilojoules. So we're, we're trying to figure out the energy range that we could we could afford, we could pack in, and, uh, you know, but it's, it's an exciting time. It would change the paradigm in operations. And... You know, we've included this in our corporate agreement. This is the cover of the proposal we just submitted for the next five years. If we get it, it'll be, you'll see it in the press because it'll be the first time our corporate agreement will pass half a billion dollars. So it's basically we're asking for, on average, $100 million a year for the next five years because of that sustainment activity. So hopefully that will be put in place before the end of September of this year. 
but we're using this technical roadmap for Omega Next service as an integration theme through that proposal. So uh, both to drive the physics and the technology, uh, and we're reaching out to GIDs and stuff like that as well to try to figure out how we can bring in machine learning and AI into the, the work that we do as well. So with that, I will finish and answer any questions. By the way, that's it. Yeah. So, just, just for fun, when I showed you the foam ball, it's hard to understand how what a great technique that is. That's Rush Reese at one minute, million linear scale. So, that was 3D printed. That's a 20 micron scale bar given here, depending on your natural hairstyle, what conditioner you use. It's somewhere between 50 and 100 microns. So, that would sit on a human hair. And that was 3D printed with a 2PP system. So, and I mean, and look at the detail. I mean, that that's the power of that system. So, you know, we're only just starting to scratch the surface of what we can do with the uh, photon polymerized uh, 3D printing. Thank you, good Chris. Wonder, wonderful. I'm sure there are some questions. So let's take questions in the room first. Yeah. So other than the fact that it's probably cheaper to manufacture a target and doesn't require a whole rock. Um, if you were to solve the cross beam energy transfer problem, what exactly are the advantages of direct drive over? So, so great question. So the question was, what's the advantage of direct drive over all run driven? Uh, 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 assuming you can solve C bit. So on NIF, the back end capacitors on NIF are something like three hundred megajoules. So you take three hundred megajoules electric to turn it into. I think about five-ish megajoules of infrared yeah. or four megajoules, you get two megajoules of blue going into the whole room. The advantage of the whole room is when you heat, up, you heat that gold up to a million degrees, you're using those x-rays, which are fairly uniform to heat the capsule. But you're only putting 200 kilojoules into the capsule. So you've lost 10% of the energy you invested in laser light just to make the x-rays. So... Um, so for us in direct drive, when Livermore says they've got a gain of one and a half, we think, well, we forget the whole wrong. What did the capsule do? The capsule had a gain of more than 15. So, and we can envision lasers that could be, call it 10% efficient. So you actually now see a path to energy engineering break even, where you could actually be making more energy than you started with maybe not economically, but you could show that next step. And so, so for us, that's the beauty of direct drive is we pick up that fa factor of 10 efficiency because we don't need the whole runs. Back in the day, 92, the government made exactly the right decision. You know, whole runs were more relevant. Whole runs you know, covered up some of the sins of the laser at the time. Uh, and so it was the right path to go on. Now, if we knew now what... Uh, if we knew in 92 what we did now, I believe NIF would have probably had equal direct drive and indirect drive as a, as a design point. So great question, thank you. Please, go ahead. <laughs> What's the main limiting factor for the amount of shots per day? Great, great question. So the first one is, um, the easy one, money, right? So how many people and stuff do we have? But the real, the real technical limitation is, back to the efficiency of the laser, because we pump the neodymium glass with flash lamps, so it's a very spectrally broad flash, you just like your camera flash, so it's effectively white light almost, or you know, a little bit, you know, different spectrum, but pretty close. Uh, the fraction of the energy we actually use to drive the transition that's going to pump the inversion, that we'll take the gain out as a, you know, in the form of gain in, in the laser, is actually quite small. So the rest is all wasted heat. Uh, so everything heats up, including the glass. So we need to let it all cool back to get back to a, a stable operating point before we shoot again. So there's two paths to fixing that. One is uh, some designs for actively cooled amplifiers so that you, whatever, the waste, whatever the waste heat is, you take that out of the system quickly. The other path is to not put in as much heat to be wasted in the first place. And that's uh, using diodes to pump the transitions directly. So it's much more efficient. Unfortunately, diodes are, you know, the capital cost is pretty expensive. So, so you're trading initial investment against uh, uh, higher operating efficiency. We probably believe for Omega Next, we'd want to do diodes um, just because the other thing is uh, electricity bill. Because uh, if, we're, if we're operating it, say, 
um, let's make it 500 kilojoules per shot, right? Just make the math easy. Every five minutes, right? You're starting to look at power levels that will average uh, hundreds of, you know, kilowatts. Uh, and so, or, you know, in a megawatt year, there's a million bucks at present electricity costs. So, so one is the cost of it. Second is, can you get that enough, enough power in? The, the big computer platforms have actually struggled with that. You know, a, a high performance exascale class computer operates at 10 to 20 megawatts electric continuous. So right now, Los Alamos is putting in whole new transmission lines to bring power up the hill to power their X scale computers because they just did not have the delivery system capable of providing that. So, so diodes keep us away from that. We went to flash lamps. Now that 500 kilojoules, instead of being 10% efficient is 1% efficient, you know, we being megawatts of average power to sort of drive the laser. So, so, so the efficiency would ultimately limit how big a laser we could build. So that we'll have to do those trade-offs. Any other questions in this room? Let me ask yep. if people or they want okay. I, I assume amongst many other factors, uh, the yield that you get has some relation to the size of the target. Yes. So that being said, what limits the current target sizes and what has need what needs to happen for the Target size to be scaled up. No, great, great question. And so that's where NIF has actually pioneered the, the direction because since even though NIF is a little bit inefficient in the laser light into X rays, it's still delivering 200 kilojoules to that capsule. So the NIF capsules are more like three or four millimeters in diameter versus our one millimeter diameter. So, so we do know how it's, most things get easier as the capsule gets bigger as far as fabrication goes. Um, the, the problem is. Um, the density of the ablator. So right now, Livermore is using di uh, diamonds, basically high density carbon. They're not allowed to call it diamond for various reasons, but it's high density carbon. So, um, uh, but it's uh, manufacturing that is very hard. In fact, the, some of the breakthrough shots have been because the capsule was actually near perfect, which they've struggled to get out of the vendors. So. So bigger, if you can stick with plastic or some standard materials, makes it much easier. If you have to flip to some of the exotic materials, then you actually start buying some you know, fabrication issues because you know, we've known how to make small plastic things for a long time. How you make small diamond things are a challenge. What is it about the design of the NIF lasers that pre prevents them from pursuing direct drive research? Well, they were meant to not preclude it. You know, that was what was written into the, the guidance, but it was based on money. So, um, so when this started, it was proposed to be $1.2 billion. When they first realized they had problems in 1999, uh, they came out, the problem was maybe a few hundred million dollars. You know, $2 billion later, you know, it was the right answer. So, uh, so anything that required uh, additional dollars above that, they sort of like dropped pretty quickly. So when they designed the switchyard, they had the ports built in the chamber that would allow you to do spherical illumination. But when they built the switch yard, that was designed just to drive the ports. Uh, they did not design the infrastructure that would allow you to put in the base plates and all those sort of things to sort of smooth out the beams. So, so it was basically at the time, uh, cost that basically drove the things out. And now, of course, once you've built a massive facility like that, you know, one of the things that drove the cost up was they didn't know actually how to pack the whole thing in the building. They, cheap, they, they, they cheaped out on the building early instead of making the building big. And so that just drove massive costs into how they actually constructed the laser. Um, and so there's just the, 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 the monumental task to sort of reconfigure. I mean, go ahead. About five years ago, we actually did a costing exercise to convert this to direct drive. A little over $500 million in three years of absolute shutdown. Yeah. And NIF, yeah, yeah, you know, and this operational budget is three hundred million dollars a year. So three years of shutdown is a billion dollars of lost opportunity costs. So and you take the five hundred million and build it here. <laughs> That's a better, better plan. Okay. Any questions from people on the Zoom? Anyone on online? You can type on the chat or just ask the question at this time. No, I don't hear any. There was one more question. Okay. Yeah, so 
to be kind of a loaded question, but what exactly is the end goal of ICM technology? Because I know that certain magnetic fusion schemes that seem to be a lot more commercially promising as far as actually delivering power to the grid soon. Um, I know that ICF is used for stockpile stewardship yep. of research of that sort. But like if let's say, you know, the Holy Grail is achieved where you can achieve ignition in something like in a facility like the LLE with like 25 shots a day all of them igniting, what exactly would be the outcome? No, great question. So I'll touch on the stockpile stewardship one just quickly, then I'll jump to the energy one. So uh, the last US nuclear test was uh, September 23rd, 1992, a shot called the Vider. That day was the last day fusion was a tool for stockpile stewardship in the laboratory, right? Albeit that laboratory was about 3,000 feet underground. Uh, uh, and so, so that's why NNSA has been pursuing ICF, is to bring fusion back as, into the, the whole toolkit for stockpile stewardship. Now, the energy question is a good one, right? So, um, as well, I mean, so magnetic fusion, you're right, has some compelling advantages. Uh, one, uh, its duty cycle, cycle is more appealing, right? In principle, you can hold the plasma there continuously, feed fuel in continuously, keep it heated continuously, and make energy continuously. So that duty cycle is, looks energetically more uh, attractive. The problem with me, uh, again, back to fundamental principle, plasmas above 10 EV are smarter than us. Um, you've got this plasma sitting in many thousands of EV, so the amount of magnetic field you need to hold it compared to the pressure in the plasma, the magnetic pressure to kinetic pressure is called beta. And so most magnetic fusion systems operate at betas at less than 0.1. So to hold the plasma there, you're putting a plop and big magnetic field on it. And yes, superconducting magnets and stuff help, but the capital cost of the facility relative to the energy production can become a problem because of that. And so ITER, the international test reactor just now, I've actually lost track of the cost. It's it's never take thirty billion dollars, right? It's got four gigajoules in the magnetic field, right? Four gigajoules is equivalent to one ton of explosives, right? I, a metric ton of explosives going on here would not be a good day for most of the campers, right? So it's a huge amount of energy. It's got the ether's got 140 coils, dynamic coils just to control the elm and stability modes that pop up. It's got neutral particle injection ahead of the diverters to take the momentum out of the particles, hitting the diverters, so the diverters last a little bit longer. Incredibly complex, right? So you start rolling all that up, and it's like, okay, if it works, you're making electricity continuously, but it's you know, there's a, you know, economically, is it really hitting economic efficiency? So for IFE. <laughs> What we see is the advantage is if, if, if you can solve all the problems and it becomes a path, you're going to trade potentially lower capital investment, depending on the laser technology, uh, with you know effectively higher energy production per unit space compared to something like a, a magnetic system. But they're all hard problems. None of these are easy. And so it makes sense for multiple approaches to try because uh, who eventually gets the innovative solution will be important. And then there's other classes of, you know, Z-pinch driven fusion and some other small companies that are looking at, you know, alternate ways to try to find out that optimum balance. But, you know, Magnetic has had more money invested in it because it was always based on fusion energy. It doesn't have been a stockpile stewardship measure, uh, measurement mission. And so they spent more time thinking about energy production than we have. But, uh, but there are challenges in really in both cases. And honestly, the thing uh, that I always like to say is, you know, we talk about limitless fuel from deuterium and water. People forget to mention tritium. Right? That's not in water. Right now, the only place to make tritium is in a, a nuclear fission reactor, either with a heavy water reactor or a, a, a tritium producing vulnerable absorber rod using lithium, you know, in a reactor. So, a fusion reactor, actually, independent of how you do it, is really a tritium factory with a plasma attached, right? So, because you have to breed your own tritium, it's almost perfect recovery. 
to refuel your reactor because, yeah, you, the deuterium is easy, but DD fusion, the cross sections are a factor of 100 more, and good luck with that. So, so you, you know, that's where you need the tritium. And so that, that's a universal challenge. And, you know, LLE, you know, we actually are, are the only academic institution in this country that routinely use tritium. So actually, a lot of people are coming to us for help with how they do tritium handling and stuff. So Walter Shabeda has a, has a joint appointment in the, the chemistry department is sort of our expert on sort of tritium handling and tr tritium purification. So they're both big challenges. Magnetic might get there first, but it's, it's hard to tell right now. Okay, so there's a last question on the, on the Zoom. On the chat. Yeah. I'll read it to you. How do the surface property of the capsule affect the interaction? Oh, great question. Do you need to expect the micro roughness, et cetera? Are they coated to absorb more? Yeah, no, great question. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so Rayleigh Taylor instability is an interchange instability. So, if you don't mind sp spilling your beer, here's, here's a trick for you. Go take a beer glass that's like three quarters full, put a coaster on it, and turn it upside down, right? It doesn't fall because the, the partial vacuum you're pulling is enough to hold the weight. But more importantly, the, 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 the coaster stabilizes the interface, right? So the beer stays. Try to tip it any other way, you can do it fast, it swaps, because the beer is denser than the air, and you're trying to push the air with the beer, it doesn't like that. And so it does an interchange instability. It wants to change position. So the beer passes through the air, the air goes behind it. These plasmas, when you accelerate them at you know, 10 to the 10 G, the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. So the plastic is actually a little bit denser than the deuterium tritium ice. And so, and you know, the the, the laser plasma behind it is lighter than plastic. So it wants to try to interchange in all these interfaces. And so any roughness gets amplified by the Rayleigh Taylor instability because it goes like goes like acceleration. And so the growth rate is, you know, which goes in the exponential is linear in the acceleration. So any density discontinuity, any small ripple, either from the laser light or from the, you know, the target can cause an instability growth. And so, yeah, so we spend a lot of time trying to make the capsules as smooth as possible. On that foam ball, one of the challenges was 3D printing it with precision, but making it random because it has to, on average, average out to a constant density. Uh, and we spent a lot of time figuring out how you seam it together so that there's no dis density discontinuity because that would also see the instability. So, yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, you, you know this is precision. Okay. All right. I think we need to close at this point. Thank you once again. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs>